Okay, so thank you so much for having me tonight. And um, I am a cat behaviorist, and I will say it's not your everyday job. So as a certified cat behaviorist, I am often asked, why do you spend so much time helping cats? Why don't you wanna spend your time helping people? But the truth is, whenever you help cats, you are also always helping people. People tend to assume that if a cat has a behavior problem, that problem must be with the cat. Most of the time, this simply is not true. Many of these cats are not difficult and they don't have behavior problems at all. The fact is, their humans have problems and this creates problems for the cats. So whenever a human being has a serious problem, such as illness, bereavement, job loss, divorce, a pandemic, you will often find a cat suffering at the other end of it. So I have really learned that you really never help a cat without also helping a person. Now, don't get me wrong. I help a lot of people whose cats won't use the litter box. Cats who scratch on everything except for that lovely scratching post that you brought for her. And what to do when you bring home Fluffy as a companion for Puffy. And as it turns out, Puffy didn't want a new brother or sister all that much. But I also help people in distress. For example, just recently, a woman contacted me to say she would have to surrender her cash. Now, she started off the conversation by telling me she was sure there was nothing I could possibly do. You see, she had cancer and she had several small children. She was terrified, exhausted, and completely overwhelmed. Amidst all of this, she had an older cat and she was feeling bad because she couldn't give the cat enough attention. This woman and I talked for a very long time. I spent a lot of time listening. I listened to her describe her situation. Eventually I said, your children are stressed because you're sick, but they will feel even more stressed if they lose the family cat at the same time. I also reminded her that cats are fundamentally loyal, caring, and incredibly perceptive animals something probably a lot of you guys already know. So if her cat didn't get the same amount of attention for a period of time because she was getting treated for cancer, well, that cat was part of the family and that's what families do and that's okay. I also explained to her that her cat would surely prefer to give up some attention temporarily rather than to be separated from her, from her family permanently. Sometimes people just need to be reassured. By now, the woman was crying. She said to me, do you really think it would be okay for me to keep my cat? So what I learned was she really didn't want to give up her cat at all. She wanted to do the right thing. She just wasn't sure what that was. She ended up keeping her cat, and I promised my help and support. And this is what I do every single day. I work to solve cat behavior problems so people do not have to sacrifice the cats who they love. Now, I do a lot of cat behavior counsels. Between, nine, between 900 and 1,000 cat behavior cases every single year. And I do them all completely free of charge. It's my personal mission in life that I never want there to be a financial barrier preventing people from keeping their cats in their homes. But when you work with that many cats and that many people, you start to notice some interesting patterns and some things that people think. So I'd like to highlight a few of those now. So first, cats do not act out of revenge or spite with their pee or poop. Oh, I hear tales of woe. She peed on my bed to teach me a lesson. She peed on my laundry because she was mad at me. 
She peed on my luggage because she knew I was going to go away on vacation. She peed on my shoes because she doesn't like my new boyfriend. Well, actually, maybe that one could be true. Cats are very good judges of character. But in all seriousness, I want everyone to know that cats do not pee inappropriately out of spite or revenge. Cats want to use their litter boxes. Cats are fastidious creatures. If your cat isn't using her box, it's because something or someone in her mind is preventing her from using that box. Now, I do understand that it is easy to assign human qualities to cats because they really do share so many of our emotions. But spite and revenge are qualities we humans can proudly call our very own. Second, you know that big basket of toys you have sitting in your living room or that big bucket of solo toys is in your dining room and every once in a while you throw them all out on the floor? Okay, that is not what I mean when I say I want you to play with your cash. Throwing a bunch of solo toys on the floor is not, pl is not play for your cat because play is supposed to simulate a hunt. And with solo toys, the cat has to be both the predator and the prey. And that is not very realistic to your cat. I hear this all the time. So many times people say to me, oh, my cat doesn't play. Oh, my cat, she's too old. She's too lazy. She doesn't play. But the problem is we don't take the time to properly trigger the cat's prey drive. You really need to think about play simulating a hunt. And the best way to do this is really with a fishing pole type toy. So you can move the toy around as if it were a prey. So always keep in mind that when you play with your cat, it's supposed to simulate a hunt. So use a fishing pole type toy because that way you can really manipulate the prey. You can, sometimes the prey is up, sometimes the prey is down. Maybe the prey slithers around something. Maybe the prey hides under the furniture. So you really want to think about um, replicating a hunt for your cat. Now, when you're playing with your cat, the most important part of the game is the capture. So many people think the point of the game is how long they can keep that toy away from the cat. As soon as the cat gets close, they yank it away again. But the truth is you want to let your cat have multiple captures. Your cat will feel empowered and happy with the physical, tangible success that comes from watching, stalking, pouncing, and ultimately capturing. So that capturing is the rewarding part. It's the captures that release all those feel good chemicals. It's the captures that make your cat feel like queen of her territory or king of her castle. So we really need to let your cat get those captures. So whip out that fishing pole type toy, forget those solo toys and stay with the game for a while. Intersperse the chasing and the pouncing with plenty of captures. Now, to make it a perfect play experience for your cat and to simulate that hunt, finish the game with one last final juicy capture. So the prey gets tired, the prey gets injured, the prey dies, and the cat now gets to capture his prey. And to make it perfect, your cat's gonna wanna eat his prey. So you should always follow the final capture with a little bit of food. This um, simulates the feast after the hunt. And this is gonna make your cat feel super duper happy, confident, and just really, really create positive associations. And this is what you wanna do when you play with your cat. So along that topic, now let's talk about laser pointers. I really, really wish pet supply stores did not sell laser pointers as toys for cats. They were developed to be used for PowerPoint presentations in the office, and that is where they should stay. Laser pointers are actually the cause of many 
cat behavior problems in cats. So think about it. Your poor cat is on this futile chase, pointlessly trying to get that little red dot that can never be captured. Certain of a sure cat, he pounces, only to find there's nothing there, nothing between his paws, nothing between his teeth. It creates frustration and anxiety in cats, the exact opposite of what we wanna do when we play with our cats. Interestingly enough, laser pointers can even cause problems between companion cats. Laser pointers leave that cat really wanting a capture. So that a cat may try to get a capture in a way that's not so acceptable to the companion cat, like chasing the companion cat or pouncing or attacking the companion cat. So remember, cats do expect a catch and kill after play. So a cat who is teased with a laser pointer may try to attack, bite, or scratch a companion cat or even a human in the household. It's an unwinnable game for your cash. So play smart, play safe, and play in a way that, that, that satisfies your cat's natural hunting instincts. And use a fishing pole type toy when you play with your cash. She will thank you for it. And, you, and the best part is you and your cat are just having fun and you're part of the game. So using a fishing pole type toy really creates an incredibly strong cat-human bond. So last, last little cat myth here. Cats do not want privacy when they use the litter boxes. Now, covered litter boxes from a human perspective may provide privacy, but we are placing a human need onto our cats. We want privacy, so we think, oh, I'm gonna give my cat privacy. But guess what? Your cat wants the exact opposite. Many times when I work with people and their cats are having litter box issues, I will find out there is a covered box. So. When your cat is in that peeing or pooping position, she's in a very vulnerable position in her litter box. So she wants a clear visual field all the way around her. She wants to be able to see potential opponents or invaders or predators. And she wants to know, should an opponent appear, she has ample escape potential. So a covered litter box, completely reduces the cat's visual field. And worse, should an opponent appear, the only way out is through that one entrance right into the opponent's face. So covered litter boxes are not very reassuring for your cat, and they just don't provide the safety and security that cats really want. Um, the most important thing for your cat is to be able to see all the way around her when she's in that box. So toss that cover if you're having a litter box problem and chances are you will solve your problem. Now, I wanna point out that even an only cat in the household who's never been outside and never been around other cats will still get this feeling. These opponents or invaders can be real or imagined. So it's just in the cat's instinct that she always wants to be protecting herself when she's in that litter box. So she needs to have a clear visual field and she needs to have ample visual warning time to escape. And this is very important to a cat. Privacy is not important to a cat. Um, my neighbors have an outdoor cat and that cat will poop on the front lawn with a trail of cars going by. So privacy is not something cats care about. So you're probably wondering how I got here. How did I get to this point in my life where you know, this is what I do. Um, I guess like a lot of things in life, I'm gonna blame my parents. My parents' view on pets, cats or otherwise, could not possibly have been more different. My father grew up in Dorchester, Massachusetts in a small crowded apartment that his immediate family shared with his extended family. The apartment did not, did not allow pets. And not that it would matter. There wasn't any room. 
and my father's family was extremely poor. They could barely feed and take care of themselves. On the other hand, my mother grew up in a single family home with lots of room and pets were cherished family members and cats were beloved companions in the household. Later in their marriage, my parents were forced to strike a bit of a compromise about pets in our home when their firstborn, me, seemed to have discovered an endless parade of cats in our neighborhood who really needed me and who somehow ended up at our house. But with all of these cats came lessons on responsibility. And I can remember this, it, it could have happened yesterday. I was sitting at the breakfast table, eating breakfast, and my dad came down the stairs and saw me eating breakfast. And he said to me, Rachel, have you fed your cats yet? And I said, oh no, dad, as soon as I finish breakfast, I'm gonna feed the cats. And he said to me, no, you need to feed your cats before you feed yourself. They are dependent on you. You are, your, you are their caregiver. It's your responsibility to take care of them first before you take care of yourself. And I always remembered that lesson. And I will say to this very day, the first thing I do when I wake up is feed my cats, make sure my cats have water, clean the litter boxes and take care of my cats before I do anything for myself. I deeply loved all of these cats growing up and mourned their loss when one died. And at some point as a little girl, I began to memorize the names and faces of all of the cats who had lived, loved, and then died at our house. One day I asked my dad, who I should mention was a rabbi, whether all of those cats would, would meet me in heaven and whether they would recognize me and I them. He assured me that they would, that the cats would remember me and I would remember them forever. Thinking back, this lesson was about my father's assurances that relationships with our cats last, that our relationships with our companion cats have meaning. Our relationships with our cats are enduring. They are important. And to me, growing up, it meant that they are worth saving. So my name is Rachel Geller. I'm a certified cat behaviorist, and I'm ready to take all of your cat behavior questions now. Thank you very much. Okay, so if anybody has a question, please put it in the chat. So I'm happy to answer all of your questions, concerns, stuff you've always thought about cats, wondered about cats. Um, so go at it. Um, so somebody asked, do cats respond to being praised? So they do. They may not understand the exact words you're using, right? But cats understand um, tone, and they, and they also pick up on our smells and our scents. So when we're happy, we give off certain pheromones. When we're um, scared, we give off, you know, we, the adrenaline is going, we give off a certain, we emit, we emit a certain odor. And cats are much more sensitive to these odors and pheromones than we are. So, you know, if somebody's afraid, I don't necessarily smell fear, but um, cats do. So yes, so when you lavish love and affection on your cat, you're typically using a very soothing, loving tone. And so cats absolutely respond to this. They, they understand when you're happy about, you know, with them and they will respond in kind. So not only will they know that you are praising them, but they will repeat that behavior because you're letting your cat know that whatever they did or you know, whatever happened, that was a good thing. So not only do they pick up on the tone of your voice, they're picking up on the smells and feelings that you are emitting. So yes, they absolutely respond to, to being praised. And it's interesting, that's a good question too, because a lot of times people say to me, 
and they can't understand the word no. And, you know, they hear that sound and syllable a lot, right? Like, you know, the word no, you might say it's going to snow or let's end on a happy note. I mean, that's an, a syllable they hear a lot. But they do understand, obviously, if your voice is raised, if there's a certain tone, they pick up on the smells you're emitting if you're upset. So it's not so much the words, but it's all of the accompanying and ancillary things that go along with that word that your cats really understand. Okay, the next question is, my cat won't drink water out of her water dish. She splashes out and then tries to drink the water of the sink instead. She also tips her fountain over and tries to pull the little motor out. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a common thing with cats. Um, you know, just like us, cats can have their quirks or the little idiosyncrasies. I may have a few of my own. Um, so, you know, one little trick I have for getting cats to drink water, if you just have that cat who doesn't like the, the, the water in a bowl or water in a dish is I will tell people to just add a little bit of water to their wet food. Put a little water into the wet food, mix it in, and that way they're getting water that way. Um, the other thing you can do is try a very shallow dish because some cats like to see the motion in the water. So sometimes a very, very shallow dish is better than a bowl. Um, but it is common that cats like to put the, their paws in it or see it move. They, that's how they know that the water is fresh because you know if they were outside, typically the water they were drinking might be like in a brook or a creek or something like that. So that is a common thing. So, you know, try, I would say the two easiest things, the path of least resistance is add a little bit of food, um, water to the wet food. You could even add it to dry food too. If your cats, if you leave out dry food for your cats to graze on, you can put a little wet food on, I mean, sorry, a little water on top of the dry food. The dry food will absorb it and they'll still get that moisture content that way. But try a more shallow um, dish or bowl as well. Okay, a similar question is, um, any advice on getting a cat to drink water? My cat will only drink from my hand. Okay, well, that's just like the cutest thing ever. <laughs> so what your problem is, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, so the same thing, you know, um, you could, if the cat likes the smell of your hand and the, the smell of your hand is something the cat is finding comforting, you could try, and sometimes this helps too, um, you know, rub your hands really thoroughly around the edge of her water bowl. Um, so she has the smell of you on her water bowl and her food bowl too. So, you know, um, if, if the reason she likes to drink out of your hand is because she likes to be, um, she likes your scent, you know, she feels happy with it, just put your scent on these other items so she will, go to that too. And, and you can do things gradually. You know, you can rub your hand on the bowl um, and then maybe sit with your cat, you know, with that bowl, try to do it like a little bit, sort of um, um, gradually get her to, to the bowl. Um, and I think the same thing too, try a smaller, more shallow dish for the water. So it's, it's um, a, little, a little easier to access. And, and, you know, go ahead and rub your hand a lot on, along the edge of that. And so I think that might help too. And the same thing for your, if she's only drinking out of your hand, you know, you can, you can sneak in a little water too by adding water to the wet food, adding water to the dry food. You know, you can kind of like inject it in in other ways as well. Um, there are even some cat foods that are formulated to have extremely high water content and you could look into that as well because it is a common problem that not all cats like to drink out of water bowls it's a it can be against their instinct okay um the next question is my cat has a problem with marking he would do it very rarely in the past but it's gotten much more frequent since i began living with my boyfriend he actually seems to prefer my boyfriend to me. He'll go sit with him on his lap 
rather than be rather before mine, but he still marks despite cleaning it up and trying different products meant for calming. Okay, so um, he's marking, um, I'm assuming, did you, I don't know if you moved in with your boyfriend or he, the boyfriend moved in, but that's okay. Um, so cats mark to make sure their territory is um, denoted as theirs. So they're marking to claim their territory. So we can do a few things to get your cat to mark in other ways and still solve that, you know, let the cat feel like he's marking his territory, but not with P. So the first thing I suggest is cats also mark with um, the, their sense around their mouth and their face, right? So you, I'm sure everybody here will, knows their cats will rub against them with their chins, with their mouths, you know, around th this area of their faces. So they're depositing their sense on you. So we can do things to um, encourage your cat to mark with his facial deposits rather than pee. Um, so a few ways you can do this. The easiest is they do make like these, um, brushes that your cats can rub against. They can adhere to walls or wherever he's marking. So get some of those um, brushes that are made that a cat can go like, you know, rub against himself and, and get and rub his deposits on. And you could adhere them to the wall in the areas where he's marking. So typically cats mark like four to six inches vertically. So put a few of these products along the wall where he's marking to encourage him to mark with his facial pheromones as opposed to pee. So that's one thing you can do is they do come in adhesives for this exact reason. Stick a few of these to the wall in the air where he's marking. So he'll be encouraged to use facial deposits rather than pee. The other thing you can do is cats also like to mark via scratching. So we all know they use the scratching post or sometimes our furniture to scratch, but scratching also has another purpose. Um, there are um, olfactory pads in the cat's paws and they leave deposits that way through marking when they scratch. So we could also put a scratching post or a scratching pad in the areas where he's marking to, to um, encourage him again to mark via scratching rather than peeing. The other thing you can do is put, um, small bowls of dry food in the area where he is marking because cats will not mark or pee where they eat. So if you put a little bit of food in those areas, that is another little trick to get the cat to stop marking. Um, I think you said you are trying pheromone products. Um, one, thing, one thing I find works better with the pheromone products is the spray rather than the plugins, because the spray, you can directly target the area where the cat is going. So try those four things. Get him to mark the area with his facial pheromones, scratching posts, scratching pads, um, um, place a little bit of food there, and you know maybe spray the uh, pheromone product rather than have the plugins. If you need more help with this, um, I know we're gonna have my website up there at the end of this um, webinar. Feel free to contact me through my website, drrachelcatbehavior.com. I do all of my work completely free of charge and happy to go in this further depth if you need it. Okay, I just put the website in the chat also. Um, so the next question I have, and, and raise your hand or, let me know somehow um, if you'd like to ask a question verbally. It's not a big group, so I think yeah, that that's would be fine. fine. Um, I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna get to one question in the chat box, and then I'll 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 um, unmute Stephanie. Uh, why does my cat randomly decide to poo next to the litter box mm -hmm. instead of inside the box? She has multiple boxes, five in different locations on different floors. All are kept meticulously clean daily. They are low walk-in, so no problem with her getting into a litter box. Always urinates in a box, just occasionally goes poo outside of the box. So litter box problems re um, require a lot of detective work. So 
I'm going to go through some of the more common things, but again, feel free to go to my website because um, we might need more on this than I have time for bullet points in this um, presentation. But you can have the most perfect box in the world, uncovered, super clean, easy in, easy out. But like a lot of things in the cat's life, the perfect box in the wrong location can still equal failure. So sometimes I tell people to do what I call a real estate reality check and really make sure your boxes are not in a place where um, the, the visual field is hampered at all because that is going to affect your cat using the box. So if your box is tucked tightly into a corner, that blocks the cat's visual field. If it's under a table, under a desk, that's blocking the cat's visual field. If it's against the wall, you know, so the cat just notices a wall there and knows she can't see past it. She doesn't understand that that wall, you know, is, is the end of the room. Um, if the box is on the same side as the entrance, then she can't see out the, out the entrance, you know, if an opponent was going to come into the room. So there are so many things that go into the location of the litter box. You really want to make sure that that the box is in a nice wide open area, especially, you know, the pooping position is a very vulnerable position. The cat won't go in there if he feels he does not have a clear visual field and ample escape potential. So in your case, the cat knows where the box is. For some reason, he's just afraid to venture into the box. So, um, you know, we can always set up a Zoom and I can look at your setup but really look at it carefully. You know, people will say to me, oh no, the box is in a great location and I'll, I'll be on the Zoom and it's pushed up against a wall or it's wedged behind a toilet. Or um, the other thing is if your cat has to go on an indoor hike to get to his box, sometimes they don't always want to, you know, make that journey. So make sure the box is, you know, really in a nice, easy, accessible place. It's wide open, it's not covered. Um, I think you said it was step in, but you know, make sure the sides aren't really high. Because remember, you know, your cat is only a few inches off the top of that litter, you know, when he's actually going. So high sides can make a cat feel too closed in. Sometimes litter boxes are near a window and a cat has maybe seen an outdoor cat or some other animal. So there's a lot that goes into it. Really look at your setup and think of ways that you can maybe, um, improve the visual field and the location of your boxes. Okay, I'm going to unmute Stephanie and she's going to ask um, her question. Just one second. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep, you can. Okay, um, my male tiger cat um, is very interested when I bring in flowers for arrangements. He particularly likes um, wildflowers that have grass-like leaves that are a little bit spiky, not spiky, but you know, they're not smooth. And he likes to chew those. So I let him, and he very often will um, upchuck. Is that bad for him? Yeah, I wouldn't feed your cats any type of plants because yeah, oftentimes they will throw up. Um, but what you can do is put the plant someplace safe and provide your cat with cat grass. They do make cat grass at pet supply stores. Yeah, I so have that grass. Perfect. He just, he just yeah. likes these weeds. He likes these grass-like things to chew. He gets very excited yeah. about it. Yeah, I would, I would, I would personally not, you know, give is clearly upsetting his stomach. Um, I, I thought maybe sometimes he wanted it to, you know, he was like a laxative or something. I don't know. Yeah, my best advice, I mean, you could talk to your veterinarian. I'm not a veterinarian, but I personally try to avoid giving things to my cats that will cause them to okay. grow up. So I would say don't give them the plant. Um, most cats don't want to puke and most cats don't want to have diarrhea. So I would say, you know, keep the plant away. I, I know it's I want my plant, cats. It's not a plant, it's cuttings. Sorry. It's um, not a plant, it's cuttings. Sorry. I apologize. Um, keep the cuttings away and give him the cat grass, okay. give him cat nip. I think he'll be, you know, probably feel better. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. The next question um, in the chat is 
uh, suggestions on what to do to stop the cat from biting when she is annoyed by being petted or by something else? Okay, so this is called petting aggression. And this one usually takes people by surprise because, you know, the cat and the owner seem to be enjoying this pleasurable moment, right? You're petting your cat and everything seems to be going great. And all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, your cat turns around and bites you. And you're thinking, you know, why did this happen? So this is called petting aggression. And basically some cats just um, don't tolerate a lot of stimulation, even if it's pleasurable. So here's what to do for a cat who has um, petting aggression. Most cats will have a typical threshold for their petting aggression. So for example, your cat might tolerate two minutes of petting before she turns around and bites you. Maybe she tolerates five minutes of petting. Maybe she only tolerates 30 seconds. Whatever that is, start paying attention and get a handle on how long she'll tolerate petting before she reaches that point of overstimulation. Um, so let's say, for example, she tolerates two minutes of petting, around two minutes of petting before she turns around and gives you a bite. So what we're gonna do from now on is we're gonna be really aware of the time and we're always gonna stop the petting after 30 seconds. This way you consistently leave her in a contented zone. Um, you leave her happy, you leave her content. Um, perhaps you leave her even wanting more rather than getting to that un unpleasurable feeling of, of um, overstimulation. So get a handle on the, um, the amount of petting that she'll accept and always stay under that threshold. Leave her happy rather than getting to that point that she's really like, okay, I've had enough. I don't feel good anymore. Um, you can even do it by the stroke. Let's say she tolerates five strokes to consistently stop after two and be really good about this. So always stay below that, you know, her tolerance point, um, stay underneath that threshold and be really consistent about it. Once you've gotten to the point where you can pet her for that shorter amount of time and she's not turning around giving you a bite, you can gradually, and the key here is gradually, start adding in a little bit more time. So. If we were at 30 That's seconds, super. maybe we go to 35 seconds and so forth. Um, the other thing you can do is if she tolerates, you know, two minutes and we're at 30 seconds, we can pet her a little bit, stop, give her a break, let her come down a little bit and then pet her a little more. So get a handle on what your cat will tolerate and always stay below that threshold and you will definitely solve that petting aggression problem. Okay, so um, another question is, what are good ways to exercise an indoor cat? Ah, well, my favorite thing, in case you didn't notice in my, my little speech, is interactive play therapy with a fishing pole type toy. So when you use a fishing pole type toy, you can really engage your cat. You can really get her going because you can use that toy to act like prey. You can really move it around, you know, and think about how prey would act. It might hide, it might go up, it might go down, it might slither around, it might go under furniture and so forth. So really move that toy around like prey, provide multiple captures during the session. And as I said, always wind the game down, let the cat have, you know, that final juicy capture and then have a little treat. So interactive play is a terrific way to exercise an indoor cat. The other thing is vertical space. You can let your cat feel like she's going on long journeys by having some vertical space in your home. Um, cat trees and cat perches are terrific options, but you don't have to spend a lot of money. Look around your house. Chances are you have some shelving that's going unused or you have tops of bureaus or tops of storage containers that can be repurposed as vertical space. So the more vertical space you can provide for your cat and um, climbing, jumping, navigating through shelves, navigating through high spaces is excellent, excellent exercise for your cat. Um, the other great thing for cats is interactive activity toys. And rather than, you know, that 
solo fuzzy mouse that you throw on the floor. Interactive activity toys are designed so the cat has to um, accomplish some task or overcome some challenge that usually involves using their paws or using their mouth to do something. Um, and those are terrific options as well. And last, um, my cats love those um, little battery operated mice. I just can put them on the floor and they were around and my cats like to chase those. And um, some, sometimes it could be something very simple. I hang shoelaces from the backs of the chairs in my house and I'll, I will always see one of my cats, you know, playing with that shoelace. So there's all kinds of little things you can do to give your indoor cats plenty of exercise and they can be happy and healthy indoors. Nice. Okay, there is another question in chat. We have two indoor cats, one that we've had for 10 years, a male, and one that we adopted about a year and a half ago, a female. Our male cat acts aggressively towards our female cat. Not all the time, but he does go after her and back her into a corner. She, on the other hand, just cowers and backs away. Is there a way to get our male cat to be accepting of her or at least not go after her? So um, the first thing I want you to do is get your male cat on a regular schedule of interactive play with the fishing pole toy the way I just described. Because when your cat knows he's going to get ample opportunities to chase, stalk, and ambush appropriately, and in a way that's rewarding to him, he's going to get food and, and praise and you, he will quickly learn that that's a much more acceptable alternative and rewarding alternative than going after the other cat. So it's very important to prevent this sort of chasing behavior to really give your cat this um, the interactive play sessions, and I say at least twice a day for about 15 minutes. That's number one. You know, um, this cat needs that, you know, opportunity to chase and capture. And all cats would much rather capture the prey and get the food than go after the other cat in the household. So if you give your cat this appealing alternative, cats are smart. He's going to quickly learn that he's going to be getting this opportunity twice a day. He's not going to need to go after the other cat. But in the meantime, while, while we are retraining your male cat, I want to teach you a method that's called distraction and redirection. So here's how that goes. So when, usually people know when one cat's going to start chasing the other. Um, they see a stare down. They see the posturing. The cat gets a look in his eyes. The cat is switching his tail. Whatever it is, people usually know it's going to precipitate a chase. But if you don't know, as soon as your cat gets into motion, that's okay because this method will, will, will still work. So here's how it goes. Your male cat is about to chase the female. You are going to distract that cat with a toy. You're going to throw a crinkly mylar ball or some toy that makes a noise or whip out the fishing pole type toy. In this situation, the toy I always rec recommend is a fishing pole type toy called the cat dancer toy. Now, the reason I recommend the cat dancer is it's super small. You can literally coil it up and have it under a couch cushion or between the cushions or stashed anywhere. It's they're super teeny tiny toys. You can, they're wired, you can coil them right up. Because when you distract and redirect, the last thing you want to be want to be doing is running around the house looking for that toy. So the cat dancers are like that toy you can have all over the place. So you know the male is going to go after the female. You're going to distract and redirect the, your cat with a toy. When you distract your cat with the toy, you are now taking him out of that aggressive mode and into the positive mode of a hunter. All cats would rather go after the prey. All cats would rather feel positive as hunters than anxious and aggressive um, going after the other cat. So we're gonna shift him into that positive mode of a hunter. And now we're gonna do a little impromptu play session the way I've been describing. We're gonna give this male cat multiple captures. We're gonna simulate a hunt. We're gonna do the wind down, final capture, food. Now, when we do a play session that ends with the wind down, final capture and food, 
we are not we are now placing that cat into his natural hunt eat contentment relax cycle which ex which is exactly what we want to do so now instead of him being revved up and aggressively chasing the other cat he's now been rewarded and he's calmed down and he feels good about himself so we want to get on that schedule of interactive play therapy we want to use distraction and redirection as needed and Look, I know you can't always be monitoring your cat. So I also want you to get some puzzle feeders and put those out. Puzzle feeders will give your cat, that male cat, um, something to do during the day. He'll also, um, puzzle feeders give the cat some, um, that hunting opportunity. The food is doled out intermittently. So it gets that capturing opportunity. So puzzle feeders are a great type of environmental enrichment that really, really help with this, um, chasing behavior. So last, um, try to get them to eat near each other as much as possible because um, food is a pleasurable thing for cats. And when they can eat near each other, that creates positive associations. So those would be the best things to do for a cat that's chasing another cat. And don't use a laser pointer. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions in chat. Does anyone else want to ask a question out loud? Okay, doke. Uh, David Hyde, do you know how to unmute? Here. What I find, uh, we have a male cat and I wear leggings a lot. And I don't know if it's the bare part of my leg, but he, he likes to come and nip. I think it's no. It's the, it's the fabric. And so, my husband thinks it's a fabric, but so but I like <laughs> to wear my leggings. So <laughs> so you can still wear your leggings. Um, you know, the prescription to fix that biting is the same as I, you know, just talked about. So if the only stimulation your cat is getting in his life is your ankles when you walk by, leggings or no leggings, he's going to go after, you know, you're triggering his prey drive and he's going to go after that. But like I said, cats would much rather go after the prey and have a successful hunt. So the next time he goes after your leggings, you're going to distract him with the toy, the way I just described in the distraction and redirection method, go into an interactive play session and let him learn this is a much more rewarding and satisfying alternative than going after your leggings and your ankles. Okay, that sounds yeah. It, it's a very fixable problem. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And the best part is while you're fixing your biting problem, you and your cat are just having fun. So, yeah. you know, you remain safe, your cat gets to release anxiety, you're having fun, everybody wins. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, uh, why don't you recommend a laser toy? Um, okay, because um, cats need to feel a, cats need a capture. So when you use, when you use a laser pointer toy, the cat can never catch that elusive red dot. Um, he sees the dot, he tries to catch the dot, he can never capture that dot. It's an unwinnable game for your cat. It creates a lot of frustration and anxiety in your cat. Cats expect um, a catch and kill. Cats expect something tangible. So when they see that red dot and they pounce on that red dot and they're certain they've caught that red dot, there's nothing between the cat's paws or nothing between the cat's teeth. So they never get that feeling, that rewarding feeling of the capture and the capture is the most important part of the game. So laser pointers create a lot of stress, anxiety, and frustration in cats. Um, they, they don't make a cat feel good. They don't boost confidence. They're, they're very frustrating to cats. So um, as I said before, I, I wish pet supply stores did not sell laser pointer toys for cats. You know, I think people like to sit there and whip that thing around. And, um, but your cat is just in this very frustrating, unwinnable game. 
pointlessly, pointlessly, pointlessly chasing this little red dot that can never, ever be captured, no matter how hard he tries. I was on the fence about asking my question. I was also on the fence about um, showing my video since I'm in my jammies. But <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but, uh, I will show you who's with me right now listening in. Oh, hi, sweetie. <laughs> I've seen a few cats pop up on the videos. Thanks yeah. for sharing all your, I think um, David Hyde showed a cat too. Yes. So my Go ahead, question, ask a question. Okay, my question is, let me um, put my hand down here too. Um, my question is, uh, Chino, the one you just saw, was adopted with Mocha. Mocha passed away in 2018. We had um, <laughs> an in-between cat, which actually was my um, sweetie's, my stepdaughter's cat. They didn't get along. Um, Long story, uh, sweetie and I broke up. The cat went with him, that was fine. Chino seems to like being an only cat. My question is, how do I know when and if he might be ready for another buddy? How old is your cat now? He's um, 12. Okay, so um, this, is, this is what I would recommend. Um, first of all, when you go, to, you know, think about your cat's personality. Like you don't want, um, if he's kind of shy and a little more laid back, you don't want him with a super aggressive cat. If he's super playful, you don't want him with a cat who doesn't want to be, you know, play around. So think about your cat's personality. And when you go to a shelter, you can let you, the shelter people know, this is how my cat is, you know, he's assertive or he's more submissive or whatever he is, and they can help you with that. But here's the most important thing, especially for an older cat. I would highly, highly recommend that you choose to adopt a cat who's at least four years old or older. And the reason for this is that cats go through social maturity between the ages of two and four. Um, and their personalities change a lot. So you can adopt a cat who's two, who's very submissive, and by four, he's not. You can adopt a cat who at two is super laid back, and by four, she's the alpha cat. So their personalities change a lot. Think of like humans going through puberty between the ages of two and four. After age four, what you see is what you get. So when you go to the shelter and you go to match personalities, you know that that's how that cat's going to be. So I have seen companion cats turn on each other when people adopt a cat who's too young for their older cat. So your 12 year old cat, that personality is very set in stone. It's not going to change, you know, kind of like us, right? Um, we're, you know, a certain age, we're not changing either, or it's hard. Um, so the best thing to do is to match personality and make sure the cat is past that um, social maturity age so that, you know, when, when you match it, it's going to stick. Um, gender, size is not a big contributor to cats getting along. It's more, you know, their personality and their their manner, right? So the, you know, a cat who's, they'll know at the shelter too, the cats who like other cats. So um, those are all questions, you know, things you can go to the shelter and say, this is what my cat is like. And it sounds like your cat has lived just fine with other cats. So as long as you match that cat up with a um, comparable personality and a cat that people at the shelter know gets along with other cats and, has already passed through that phase, you should be okay. You know, and no matter what, you always need to do a, a very slow, structured, proper introduction between cats. That's the most important thing. I mean, um, cats are very territorial creatures and it's very stressful for the resident cat to feel like um, her territory is up for grabs and you don't want the newcomer to think she's being plopped into enemy lines. So the most important thing is to start the newcomer off on her, in her own room and really proceed slowly. And if you do decide to adopt another cat and you need help with a proper introduction, feel free to reach out. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, does anybody else have a question? I think we're gonna, yeah. Um, Elizabeth? Oh, thank you. So um, I now have a cat, but why would a cat sit where, where, where I was sitting and I don't own that cat? 
but it never <laughs> sits where the owner sits. Well, <laughs> you're so sometimes when there's a stranger or someone the cat doesn't know well, um, so you've just le left your scent on the territory and that scent is different than his owner or his. So he now needs to deposit his scents on that territory. Cats are very big on territory and very big on, you know, marking scent deposits. And, um, you know, they always want to monitor their territory, assess the dangers. Um, if there are any opponents or invaders, they want to let those people know that they are there to stand their ground. So that is a common thing that you will see that, you know, someone new is in the house and then the cat will go and, you know, replace your sense who, which he sees as, you know, not something he's used to with his own friendly pheromones. So it doesn't mean that she likes me. It could, it could, doesn't, it just means it, you know, it, it absolutely could mean that she wants to investigate and take in your smells, especially if you, if you're a frequent visitor. Um, but if, you know, so it can mean many different things, but chance, chances are if you're an infrequent visitor, you know, she's kind of wants to reclaim that area and re, it's kind of like, like, you know, the other person who act, asked about marking, you know, once a cat marks, um, they want to, it's like it incentivizes them to keep marking that territory and keep claiming it back. So it's the same with, you know, the cat can mark in other ways. They mark with their paw pads, they mark with their facial pheromones. So you know, they, they will have that urge to want to get back on there and replace your smells with theirs. But having said that, it, it, it can definitely mean that the cat is interested in you as well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, well, um, I think that that about finishes it up for the night. And I just want to thank Dr. Rachel for, for being here and answering so many questions. That was a lot of information. And um, thanks everyone for coming. And um, um, again, her website is was listed in the chat. Um, someone did point out that there are some 404s at the top of the website. Yeah, I'll check that out. I'll have my tech person look at that tomorrow. But um... It should be working. If it's not, I'll I'll be on it. Okay, you just scroll you down. Know, technology. Everything. Yeah, <laughs> everything's there. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. I did record the session, um, and I, Dr. Rachel seems open to me sharing that recording if anyone's interested. And um, again, please check out our programming at millenlibrary.org. Also, we ordered the Dr. Rachel's book, and so it will be coming to the library. Oh, great. Yeah, so be sure to check it out. Well, and again, you know, thank you guys for having me. I think these are so much fun. I always get a lot of super duper questions. I never know what I'm going to get, and it always turns out to be a wonderful experience. So thanks for having me and for taking the time to learn more about cats. <laughs>